In this talk, we will discuss penetrating neck trauma. For the assessment of neck trauma, there are two main considerations, the type of trauma and the location. For this talk, we will only address penetrating neck trauma. We will not discuss any blunt neck trauma. So similar to every trauma and life-threatening situation, when you're assessing the neck trauma, you always need to remember your ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Assessment of the airway is crucial, not only because of the ABCs, but in particular with the neck, because there are many critical aspects of the airway that are present within the neck. A very quick way to assess if an airway is patent is to have the patient talk. If they can do this, or cry, or moan, the airway is patent. However, assessment of any potential injury is also important, and this can be ascertained by dysphonia, strider, or gurgling. Any of these signs can be indicative of an impending loss of airway. Now the reason the assessment of the airway is so important is that we need to assess if there's any potential sign of loss of an airway. If that is the case, and there's a, any concern for loss of the airway, the airway must be secure. The easiest way to secure the airway is to position the patient appropriately. Usually if the patient comes in breathing, they're breathing in a stance that they're able to comfortably continue to breathe in. In some cases, that might mean that the patient needs to sit up and lean forward. However, in the cases of trauma, we also must consider that there can be cervical or spinal precautions that need to be observed. If that is the case, then quick assessment of these structures must be done so that the appropriate precautions can be observed. Additionally, should the airway need to be mobilized, then a jaw thrust maneuver should be used. This helps to protect the cervical spine and also helps push the posterior aspect of the mandible upwards to prevent the tongue from blocking the oropharyngeal opening to the trachea. Additionally, in cases where definitive securement of the airway is necessary, orotracheal intubation provides this type of airway. It is the preferred method of definitive airway management. However, in some cases, due to the trauma to the neck or blood in the oropharynx or excessive secretions or patient factors such as size, neck circumference, etc., orotracheal intubation is not a viable option. In these cases, a cricothyroidotomy or tracheotomy may be performed. As seen in the picture here, a cricothyroidotomy is done between the thyroid and cricoid cartilage and is usually converted to a tracheostomy later. After the airway has been secured, evaluation of the wound is essential. In particular, the depth of the wound is very important. The reason for this is, if the platysma has been violated, exploration of the neck is usually mandated. Traditional zones of 1, 2, and 3 were used in the past, and zone 2 was usually indicative of a mandatory exploration. However, this is no longer the case. As you can see in the picture here, the zones are defined by various anatomic landmarks, with zone 1 being from the clavicle to the inferior cricothyroid cartilage, zone 2 being from the inferior cricothyroid cartilage to the angle of the mandible, and zone 3 from the angle of the mandible to the skull base. Additionally, when evaluating the wound, one must consider the trajectory of the penetration, i.e., was the penetration going cephalad or caudad, lateral or medial. In patients who are stable, evaluation can then proceed with CT scans or x-rays, and these can be extraordinarily helpful. A CT scan can help evaluate the cervical spine as well as the aerodigestive tract, while a CT angiogram can evaluate the vascular structures of the neck, particularly carotid artery, and the jugular veins. Foreign objects can also be seen on the scan as well. X-rays are useful in the sense of evaluating the esophagus by giving contrast and performing a barium swallow. In cases where both the trachea and esophagus mandate evaluation, endoscopy is also very useful. As we discussed before, uh, exploration of the neck is commonly necessary and it is important to know what are the indications for exploration. So, indications for exploration include 1. Wound crepitus, indicating possible injury to the airway. 2. 
expanding or pulse style hematoma indicating possible damage to the uh, surrounding vascular structures. Three, strider or dysphonia again indicating possible damage to the airway. Or four, any obvious vascular or aerodigestive tract injury. So once the decision has been made to proceed with the neck exploration, what are the common ways that we would approach this? Again, this is going to depend on the type of injury that is present. The most common type of incision that will be made is what is called the sternocleidomastoid incision. This is done on the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and allows for exposure of the pharynx, the carotid, and the cervical esophagus. In cases where more proximal vascular control is necessary, the incision can be extended caught at. When making the incision, one must try to be mindful of the vagus nerve as it sits in close proximity to most of the structures and interests. As you can see in this diagram here, the exposure provided by a sternocleidomastoid incision provides good exposure to almost all structures of the neck. However, in certain cases, a sternocleidomastoid incision may not be the most appropriate incision for the exploration. Another incision that is used less commonly is a supraclavicular incision. This incision is made approximately one finger breadth above the clavicle. The reason for this would be allowing for access to the proximal vertebral artery or most other proximal vascular structures. However, going in through a supraclavicular incision, one must be mindful of the phrenic nerve, which provides innervation to the diaphragm. Should there be any concern, for very proximal injury to any vascular structures, a median sternotomy may be indicated. In this case, the sternum is divided, usually in a controlled setting of an operating room, and this allows access to proximal injuries to the common carotid or any concern of injuries to the right subclavian vessels. Should there be any concern to the left internal carotid or the left subclavian vessels, a left thoracotomy is performed, again, usually in the setting of an operating room. So let's just quickly go over the different types of injuries that are present and that need to be dealt with. The first type of injury that is, we commonly deal with are vascular injuries. The main structures that we worry about are the common and external carotid, the internal carotid, vertebral artery, and the jugular vein. So what do we do? If there's an injury to the common or external carotid, we usually do a repair in a simple fashion. Should there be any complex injury, ligation may be necessary. For the internal carotid, as you know, this is an important structure which supplies blood to the brain. If it is a simple injury, again, simple repair is indicated. If there are no indications of neurological compromise, repair is also indicated. Should there be any evidence of neurological defects, one must carefully consider the possibilities of reperfusion injury to the brain, i.e. an ischemic to a hemorrhagic conversion. While repair can be indicated, in some cases, ligation may be the best course of action. For vertebral artery injuries, they are commonly treated with ligation or distal occlusion. Ligation can be done operatively, and distal occlusion can be done with the vascular radiologist, and this can be done either with embolization or with coils. For injuries to the jugular vein, again, if it is a simple injury, uh, repair is indicated. Additionally, one must consider the hemodynamic status and the other overall status of the patient. Should the patient be an extremis, the time taken for repair may not be appropriate. If that is the case, ligation of the jugular vein is appropriate. If there is bilateral injury, then one would consider repair of one. However, again, if the patient is unstable or an extremis, ligation of both veins is. Other injuries that we worry about are injuries to the pharynx or the esophagus. Again, these injuries are approached through a sternocleidomastoid incision. Usually, if the site of the injury is unknown, then an incision on the left side is indicated. If an esophageal injury is suspected, a dilator can be used passed through the esophagus to help identify the esophagus. When closing the esophagus or repairing the injury, usually it is done in a double layer fashion, and commonly muscle is placed over the closure to help reinforce and protect the area. Any injury to the esophagus or pharynx should be drained, and that is indicated because the oropharynx and the esophagus are both contaminated fields compared to the rest of the body, and therefore drainage is essential to preventing areas of infection. 
Additionally, treatment with antibiotics is indicated. Uh, once all of this repair has been done, further down the time course, uh, an evaluation with a swallow study is necessary to help make sure that there's no other evidence of leak at that time. The reason that this can be very damaging is because an injury to the esophagus can later lead to mediastinitis via tracking through the prevertebral space. Finally, injuries to the larynx or the trachea or the airway are very important. If there is injury to the larynx is suspected, a collar incision can help to define the airway. Once that is done, semi-elective repair by ENT is indicated. Again, with all these scenarios, securement of the airway is of the essence. If the trachea has been injured, the injury can be assessed either via the neck or through a right thoracotomy if the injury is distally or through endoscopic measures. For small injuries, again, simple repair is indicated. For large injuries, sometimes a repair plus a tracheotomy is the way that the injury should be approached. And for very complex injuries, a tension-free primary anastomosis is indicated. Again, concern for new mediastinitis should be observed given the fact that there can be tracking through the airway into the mediastinum. Commonly, this will be preceded by evidence of pneumomediastinum on a chest x-ray. To sum up everything, the key take-home points is a patient that comes in with penetrating neck trauma is often in a critical state. Assessment always, as with any trauma, begins with the airway, but then should quickly proceed to the other areas, such as breathing and circulation. As here, we've discussed the different areas of injury, particularly to the airway and circulation, but also importantly to the digestive tract, which also courses through the neck.